Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 today. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And then I'm going to go to Luke chapter 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 only. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, but it is the gift of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Luke chapter 7, out of the message paraphrase, says this. One of the Pharisees asked him, over for a meal and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table and just then a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet weeping and raining tears on his feet, letting down her hair. She dried his feet and kissed them and anointed them with her perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, that I thought he was, he would have known what kind of woman this is who was following, falling all over him. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Simon says, oh, tell me. Two, two men were in debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces. The other owed 50. Neither of them could pay up. And so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two do you think would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, Do you see this woman? I came to your home, and you provided no water for my feet, but she has rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. For you gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. For if the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. And then he spoke directly to her and says, I forgive your sins. And then verse 49 says, that set the dinner guest talking behind his back. If you want to spot a Pharisee, just start reaching lost people. That set the dinner guest talking behind his back. Who does he think he is for giving sins? For he ignored them and said to the woman, catch this, your faith. Grace through faith. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing grace of God. Lord, we thank you that the grace is not greasy, but it is amazing and it is covering. Lord, we thank you that your grace is flowing today, that it is on tap in heaven. God, we thank you that, that, that you are faithful and that, Lord, you, you, would, you would do this whole thing today for one person that is outside of the kingdom of God. And, Lord, so we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, our prayer today is that anybody that does not have a personal relationship with you or maybe has fallen away, God, that today they would, they would discover grace again. That God, grace through faith would save them today. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. The Bible does not need any help from me. It can preach all by itself. So, Father, take this word, divide as you see fit, and place it into the lives of people where they're living. And may we walk out of this place changed. And God, we give you praise in advance for everything you're going to do in this room today. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. And everybody says, Amen. If you're taking notes, I've, I've tagged the title today, Grace Through Faith. Grace Through Faith. If there's one thing that you cannot afford to miss, if there's one thing we cannot afford to understand as Christian people, if there's one thing in this book, if there's one thing in the Bible that we cannot afford not to understand or not to get a hold of or not to grasp hold of, one thing we can't afford to get wrong, hear me, it is, it is the, this word called grace. It's the amazing grace. It, 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 it's, it's, it's God's grace. It's what covers us. It's what saves us. It's the grace of God. Grace is the reason some of us are not in jail today. Grace is the reason that you're still on this planet today. Grace is the reason you're even in church today. If it had not been for, for, for God's grace, we don't know where we would be, up to, be at today. But grace is the reason that we're here. And grace is the reason that we're not counted out. Grace is the reason that, that we can come and gather no matter how, me, how messed up we are or how bad our past. But it's, it's this thing called grace. Grace, if you want to write this down, grace means favor, mercy, forgiveness, love, joy. Grace is all the stuff that you don't deserve, but God gives it to us anyway. That's the amazing grace of God. Grace is giving us, grace is giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy is holding back what we do deserve. 
Jesus is both grace and mercy. And I, I love this story. I, I love this, this, this Luke chapter 7 story of this woman. I love the story because it, it, it really resonates with, with me before I found Christ. There's this desire and hunger and knowing that I, I've got to take the moment when the moment presents itself to get myself to Jesus. Like there has to come a moment when you come to church and you're no longer coming to church just to spectate, but there's, there's a little bit of desperation in your heart. Like if, I don't, if God don't show up today, if God doesn't touch my life today, if God doesn't get a hold of my family today, if God doesn't wreck my marriage today, if God doesn't grab hold of my kids today, then I don't know what we're going to do coming on Monday. There's got to be a little desperation in our heart. And this woman in Luke chapter 7, you can say a lot about her. And she, yes, she had a big past. And yes, she had a long list of her sins. But let me tell you what she had that many of us need, need today. It's this thing called desperation in our spirit. The whole room was filled with Pharisees. And the Pharisees were around Jesus, but they didn't honor Jesus. They didn't worship Jesus. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't serve Jesus. They didn't, they didn't adore Jesus. These religious Pharisees, were, in other words, they were in the room where Jesus was, but, but, but did not take, but, but did not take that, that opportunity to, to do something great in her life. But this woman who was outside of the room knew that Jesus was in the room. And the same people that were in the room that were around Jesus didn't need nothing from Jesus. She was on the outside of the room, and she needed something that was in the room. It's called desperation in spirit. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I've got to fight off being crusty and religious. And some of y'all have been saved a lot longer than me, and so if i got to fight that off, you probably ought to fight that off too. That's why we can go through a whole worship set and never lift a hand. I forgot what service I was preaching at. Let me move on. <laughs> this woman knew that, that she, had to, she, was, she had to be willing to do something different. Not for the sake of being just, just being different. Not just for the sake of doing something out of being different than what was in the room. But she knew that different in her, in her characteristic and in her life, different was being desperate. Not just for the sake of being desperate, but she knew that desperation would grab the attention of God. Desperation. You want to get the attention for God? Get desperation in your heart. If you want to grab the favor of God and the blessing of God and the hand of God, you want to grab the attention of God, fight through the crowd, crawling on your hands and knees and barely touch the edge of his garment. That'll grab the attention of God. But getting dressed up on a Sunday morning and coming in like you are higher than the other and, and than the most high, not lifting your hands to a God, never opening up your mouth to God, that does not impress God. That actually disgusts God. Well, if you want to grab the attention of God, you'll come up, you'll come in desperate in your worship. Desperate to get through the front door. Desperate to feel God. Desperate to hear from him. Desperate to sow a seed in the offering. Why? Because we know desperation grabs the attention of God. And it's not, this, it's not just this story, it's every story that you read that Jesus encountered. The ten lepers, they were desperate to get to God. The woman with the issue of blood, de de desperate to get to God. Jairus, the, fa the, the, the father of the little girl who was dying, he was desperate to get to God. Jesus responds to being desperate. My God, don't let our church never grow away from being desperate. I don't claim to know a lot, but... Here's what I do know. God does not need you, to, need you to come to him fixed. He needs you to come to him broken. He doesn't need you to come to him all buttoned up and act like you're put together. Meanwhile, if we got underneath of your skin, you are, your life is falling apart. He does not need you to come when everything is right in your life. He does not need you to come to him when everything is in order. He does, not need to you to, he does not need you to come when you have it all together. He does not need your strength. He does not need your perfection. As a matter of fact, he needs our weakness. Because he has this way of taking everything wrong and jacked up in our lives and somehow turning it around and bringing glory and honor back to his name. He will take you, hear me, he will take you with your hangups. He will take you with your addictions. He will take you with your imperfections. He will take you with your messed up past. He will take you if you've been divorced. He'll take you if you've been sleeping around. He'll take you if you're an alcoholic. He'll take you if you're a liar. He'll take you if you're alive. He'll take you. It doesn't matter what you've been or what your past bill says. He'll take you just the way you are. But catch it. 
He'll not just take you and receive you the way that, the way that you are. He refuses to let you stay the way that you are. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God not only saved me, but he sanctified me and he filled me and he goes through life with me and he's a way making God. Come on, he's a filling God. It's not just enough to save me. Come on, he walks with me. I don't know why I'm yelling today. I didn't want to yell. I've been yelling from the beginning today. Ah, it's that Red Bull I drank before I came down. Here's what I got wrote down. We're living in a world and culture that thrives on this and says it this way. That it is, let me say it this way. It's, it's, it's addicted to looking right on the outside. That's why we have filter upon filter upon filter. That's why we only post the good pictures of a family. That's why if you would see the pictures that it got to take, uh, uh, that were taken until it got to that picture, like <laughs> the time you backhanded your daughter because she wouldn't smile and then her front tooth is missing and so she lipped. And so you, 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 you photoshopped in her front teeth that you knocked out. Because that stuff's not worthy to be put on the gram. Because the gram is only for things that look right. And we bought into that as a culture that, well, their marriage is good because look how good. Now, that's just what they, that's what they want you to make you think their marriage is like. He rolls over and his breath stinks too. And so you're dreaming about this other guy? Well, he's got issues. Just like the one you got. And hold up, wife. You got issues? Just like the other one has issues. But the gram, we don't, we don't put none of that on the gram. Because the gram is addicted to perfection and making you believe something is reality when, when we're really it's a million miles away from it. So we live in a culture, and even in church culture, we bought into the fact, well, man, we got this little excerpt of this preacher. He must be really good. Let's go to his church. And so we, we, we go to that church, and we realize, well, the church was great until you walked in. Because Instagram and social media and our culture always wants to sell you on the fact that, that, that everything is perfect in their little world. No, let me tell you, nothing ever gets posted that is actual realistic on Instagram. Even the stuff that we post about me and the preaching clips, it takes them hours to put together something that's remotely good to put out on social media. But we're focusing on the wrong thing and... We're focusing on the outside. We're worried about how we look. My middle daughter is consumed with how she looks, and she's worried about how she runs and worried about how, how she dressed, and she's worried. Why? Because it's programmed in her that she has to impress culture. And day after day, I reaffirm her that you don't have to impress anybody but your Father in heaven. You're not, you don't, it's not based on how you look on the outside. Don't compare yourself to Instagram. Don't compare yourself to the model. No, no, no. You compare yourself to yourself in the mirror and honor God. But even moms and dads were obsessed with filtering our pictures and our posts. And not only do, are, we, are we consumed with, with filtering our pictures and our posts, but now filtering has trans, transitioned into what we believe. We filter now what we believe and what we think God's word really means. We filter our convictions. What used to convict us don't convict us no more. What we used to believe, we really don't believe no more because we've bought into the societal way of what, what the Bible says versus what, what the Bible actually says. Are you with me? And so no matter how many filters that we, we apply, here's what I got down. It's extremely evident that nothing can change us on the inside that the world gives us, but the only thing that can change and transform us on the inside, it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the Pharisees, if you study the Bible, they, they were addicted to the gram. They, they loved to put on the front that they were holy. They put on their nice robes and their tassels and they walked around that they were higher than, than the average person. They, they were addicted to what they looked like on the outside. But these same Pharisees that may look good on the outside, they were in a room with Jesus and did nothing to entertain the presence of Jesus. Didn't open his door, didn't wash his feet. Surrounded in, in, the, in the environment, not like we are here, 
they actually had Jesus in the flesh in the room. And although they looked good, they were in the room and, and wanted nothing from Jesus. As a matter of fact, they were in the room just to be in the room to try to trap Jesus into something that they could take him to the cross sooner than, when he, than he wanted to walk there. How can you say that, preacher? Well, the moment the woman walks in, they didn't open the door for her. They got in their little circle and started talking about who she was and what life she lived and what kind of past she had. Here's what I know is, and here's what I love about Jesus, is he knew her story, he knew her past, he knew exactly what she had done and what she was dealing with and catch it, but yet he still loved her. The dangers of social media is we see people walk in and we see the person, we know their past, we know their long list, and yet we don't love them, we judge them. I'm not just talking about our church, I'm, I'm talking about the average Christian person. The tendency is we don't have the same level of grace that Jesus carried. And I would say this, if the church could grab a hold of the same grace that Jesus uh, walked with and offered, this church would be full every service, every weekend. Not only our church, but I'm talking the church around this world, that if we would be people that would operate and live by this amazing grace that Jesus carried. Come on, grace has to be given. It's grace through faith. Yeah, you, we may have issues. Yeah, we may have some sin. Yeah, we may have some setbacks and some struggles and some problems. But as a Christian, the grace of God isn't one of them. Jesus is not running out of grace. It can't be explained. It, can't, it's, it's, it, it has to be received. Jesus was, was grace and Jesus is grace. It's countercultural today. Our culture kills people, cancels people, quits on people, writes people off and writes people out. But I've come to tell you that even churches, we kill people too. We kill our own all the time. We, we, we have great grace for the sinner, but we have no grace for the saint. What are you trying to say? I'm saying sometimes people that are in the house do dumb things and fall out of the grace of the house. But what are they not as valuable as the one that's never come to know Christ before? Yeah, we're great at giving grace to the sinner, but how about we learn to give grace to the saved because Jesus still loves them and he's got a plan for them and he's got a purpose for them. The grace can flow both directions. Come on, I've been a part of a churches and seen people where they attack people that, yeah, I know they were saved, I know they were living for God, but they, they, they faced a hard time in their life. Do you really think they wanted to run away from God? No, I can tell you, no, they didn't. But the pressures of life and the anxieties of life and the depression of life, people, I, I know people today as I'm preaching, I'm, God is revealing them in front of my mind. I, I know people who once were plugged into church and loved God. Serving in the house, singing on this platform. And it's so easy as Christian people, they, they know better. Yes, they know better. But does that, does, does that mean we don't offer grace? Does that mean we don't reach out? Does that mean we don't love? Does that mean we don't extend a hand? Are you, are you willing to give up on the people that are saved and they've fallen away? Come on, I backslid before in my walk with Christ. I didn't come out of my mom's womb saved. I got saved when I was really, really saved when I was 17, but I backslid in that time frame. And I just thank God I had a church that didn't give up on me. A youth pastor that didn't give up on me. Moms and dads that didn't give up on me. So what am, what am I trying to say? I'm saying let's, let's be a church that does both, that has grace for the sinner but also be a church that has grace for the saint. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. Why? So that we may become the righteousness of Christ. Everywhere Jesus went, grace flowed. From the woman at the well to, the, to Zacchaeus, to choosing of his disciples, even to the scripture we read to, to, today, that Jesus, he was a walking, talking, grace-filled vessel. The gospel... Why don't you ever preach the gospel? I preach the gospel every week. The gospel is a grace message. The gospel is an inclusive message. The gospel is a far-reaching message. The gospel is a covering message. The gospel is not bad news, but the gospel is good news. The gospel is all about the amazing grace of God. The Bible says this, whoever, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Grace is what we should be. Grace is who we are as a church. Grace should be our go-to move. Like the fadeaway jump shot was to Michael Jordan, the grace of God should be to his church. Just like the flying elbow, uh, elbow drop of Jimmy, the super, super fly snooker off the top rope was his go-to move. Grace should be the go-to move of the local church. We should make excuses as to why we get people in the room instead of keeping them outside of the room. Make a long list of why they are worthy and not why they're not worthy. Because I can help you, your list of why they're worthy will be far greater than why they're not worthy. You can start with point number one, Jesus and his grace makes them worthy. The same grace that saved you is the same grace that's going to find them. And if God's grace was good for your sin, even though your sin may not look like their sin, God's grace can still cover that sin as well. That's good preaching, Pastor. That's good preaching right there. Come on, grace. Grace is who we are. It's our go-to move. Grace for ourselves. Graceful for your failures. Grace for yesterday. Sometimes it's easy to have grace for others, but you don't have grace for yourself. Learn to have grace for yourself. It's a horrible place to live your life when you don't offer yourself and extend yourself grace. Grace for today. Grace for tomorrow. Grace for others. Grace to run the race. See, here's the real question. It's not whether or not you're going to fall. The question is, when you do fall, will you stay down or will you get back up again? See, the real question that we have today to ask ourselves is, is not will people fall or let us down? No, they're going to fall and they're going to let us down. The real question we should be asking ourselves is when they do fall or do let us down, will, will, will we be the people to extend grace for their life and situation? I want to be known as a grace, a grace first church. Yeah, we're going to push you into being full on followers of Christ and we're going to push you into being sanctified and push you into loving God with your whole heart, but we also want to have grace on tap for people that are far from God. People that are going through some struggles, people that are going through some hard times. Grace Grace is not, not, not just for, for you and for, and, and for me, but it's also for people that have not made it here, here, here yet. Here's what I got wrote down. Mistakes should not shame you for the rest of your life. In other words, the church isn't a, isn't a shaming place, but it's a restoring place. The last thing people need when they walk through these doors and are coming in with a life full of sin and a life full of regret and a life full of shame is for Christian people to say, yeah, I told you that was going to happen. Yeah, they, they, they don't need that. You know what they need from Christian people? And a handout. An embrace. Come on, let's walk this thing out together. I've, I've, not always been, I've, I've, I've not always been this way. I've not always been perfect. I still struggle. I've still got issues. But together, you and me together, we can walk this thing out by faith. The church is never designed to be a place of judgment and hate and condemnation. But God's house was always to be a place where the grace of God flowed freely. Our church is not going to maim people and shame people and make people feel bad. It'll be, a, it'll be a healing place, a hospital for sick people, a safe place for hurt people. That's what we're building. The church is a workshop, a home improvement store. A body shop, a surgery room. Think about it. A ch- the local church should be a place where we don't always attract the shiny car and the new car. No, we attract the car, the wheel's about ready to fall off the back. And we need some mechanics who know how to put the wheel back on and get the, get the car back to being balanced and put the, put the alignment back into the car. So why? They can go back out on the road and, and ride itself back as, as it continues to go in its life. Are you following me? Eight minutes. Thank you, God. Number one, God uses people who make mistakes. If you've messed up, great, you're qualified. Because God uses people who make mistakes. You may have failed, but you're not a failure. God uses people who make mistakes. The devil has a, does a good job and will try and tell you that because you did this, you can't do that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God uses people who make mistakes. He'll tell you how bad you are, how bad that decision was, what kind of life you're living now, that nobody's going to be able to love you and think of you the same. Let me tell you something. No, no, no. God uses people who make mistakes. I don't care how messed up you are, how far away from God you are, how many things you did this week, you have not done too much that God's grace can't find you and cover you and protect you and build you back up. Why? Because God uses people who make mistakes. 
You may be down today, but hear me, down is not your destiny. You may be down today, depressed today, but depression is not your destiny. You may be full of anxiety, but being anxious is not your destiny. You may be lost today, but hell is not your destiny. Come on, God uses people who make mistakes. God's got a great plan for you today. Come on, even, even say, that, say that over your life. God's got a great plan for my life. God is going to use my deepest, darkest moments somehow to be glorified and, to, and, make it, uh, to, and, and just to be a, a, a testimony of how good and faithful that he really is. I know it may be hard to see it today. I know your life's been brutal recently. I know you're reaping the benefits of other people's bad decisions, but God can still use it. God can still, he has a way of taking what the enemy meant for evil and somehow flipping it around and using it, using it for good. That's Bible. God has a great plan for you and he's still developing you into what he's created you to be and do. I can promise you this. God's plan is not to harm you. It's not to shame you. It's not to hurt you. His plan, let me tell you what his plan is. It's to bring you good things. It's to bless you and prosper you and open doors for you. It's going to be for you to come out better, to come out stronger. Sang a song growing up, God's still working on me to make me who he wants to be. I sang that. Here's what I know. God will not define you by your worst mistake. People will, but God doesn't. Family members will, but God don't. Some Christian people will, but God don't. Come on, it's... It's not a question of can God use me. No, let me tell you, God uses people who make mistakes. Number two, Jesus hasn't changed his mind about you. I know you've changed your mind about yourself, but Jesus has not changed his mind about you. Other people may have, your friends may have, your coworkers may have, your spouse may have, but Jesus has not changed his mind about you. He's still after you. He still loves you. He's still fighting for you. He's still making ways for you. He's still got plans for you. Jesus has not changed his mind about you and what he's created you to accomplish. Number three, God's going to use you anyway. Some churches will, will, will choose not to use you, but God will use you. In spite of your mess, in spite of your failure, in spite of your shortcoming, God still chooses to use you anyway. In spite of the anyway that you went through, God still chooses to use you. You may have been through prison and served a term in prison, but I come to tell you, God can still use you today. You may have been an addict addicted to the needle, but I come to tell you, God can still use you anyway. You might have been divorced and went through a hard time. I've come to tell you, God can still use you anyway. You might have been a... You might have slept around one too many times, but I've come to tell you, God can use you anyway. Come on, you might have been mean-spirited and offended half a dozen people. I've come to tell you, God can use you anyway. You might have a long list of sin in your life. You might have a million reasons of why you think God can't use you, but I've come to tell you today that God can use you anyway. The proof is in Luke chapter 7, this town harlot. In other words, the prostitute of the town. If God can use her, then God can use you. If we can read about a prostitute and gain revelation of how it is the amazing that God's grace is, don't you think God can use you, Dad? And God can use you, Mom? And God can use you, sir? Come on, some of our greatest, darkest, and most, most difficult mistakes... God uses people that make mistakes. I can't imagine when this woman encountered Jesus and she left the house. I wonder how many other people came to know Jesus because of her faith. See, the thing in Ephesians 2 says it's grace through faith. The Bible says that Jesus will finish what he starts. Can I, can I, can I, can I end with this? Here's what I think. Jesus went to the dinner party. Sure, he went to the dinner party, but he didn't go to the dinner party to have dinner. 
He went to the dinner party to finish what he started. See, the Pharisees, the Pharisees thought Jesus loved them so much that he wanted to come to their house for dinner. No, Jesus could give a rip about the Pharisees. But Jesus knew that there was a woman in the town that was mislabeled, that was confused in her mind, that had been sleeping around trying to find value. And Jesus knew if I can just get the dinner party started, I'm not leaving until I finish the reason I came to start it. And so when religious people were okay with Jesus being in the room and needing nothing from him, this woman caught rumor on the ground that Jesus, they saw a picture of Jesus going in the Pharisee's house and she thought, man, this must be my moment, this must be my time. She was desperate. So I don't know what she was doing, but I do know this, that there had to come a time in her mind where she knew Jesus was in the house. And she may thought, man, I've tried everything. I've been with every man. I've tried, I've tried to find my fix on everything that man can give me. And I'm still broken. And I'm still empty. And I need the touch of God. And the Bible says that she took the perfume off of her table. And she took the very thing that represented her lifestyle. And represented her income. And represented everything that she used to be and do. And she took that thing in her hand. And the Bible says when she went into the dinner party. And Jesus was seated. And the Pharisees were circling. Bible says she took that perfume and she went through the Pharisee huddle and she burst her way through and she fell at the feet of Jesus. Not only did she fall, but she took what represented her past, all of her failure, all of the mistakes, every guy she slept with, every guy she tried to get her fix on. And the Bible says she took that vial of perfume and she broke it at the feet of Jesus. Not only did she break it at the feet of Jesus, but she began to take the very thing the very thing that she used to use to sell her body. She took the, she let her hair down. She began to wash the feet of Jesus with her hair. In other words, she was breaking herself at the feet of Jesus. I can't think of any better place to bring everything that I used to be. Every mistake I've made, every, every bad decision I've made, every wrong turn I've made. I can't think of a better place to break my past than at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because when Jesus stood up, the very thing that used to hold me down is now sitting underneath of his feet. I don't know about you, but I can tell you this. We are a generation of people who don't like to be vulnerable and don't like to break. Can I tell you, the only way you get put back together the right way is getting broke at the feet of Jesus and let him put you back together one piece at a time. It may not happen on a Sunday. It might not happen in a year. But if you just keep showing up in the room and you keep making God a priority, he will put you back together.